Welcome back to Cloud42, I'm James. Today I'm starting a new project. I'm gonna build one of the classic British tool making kits, the Hemingway Sensitive Knurler. What makes this knurling tool unique is that it has a lever and an eccentric cam so you can clamp it onto a workpiece and release it repeatedly without changing the tension adjustment. This is something I've wanted to make since I first got my lathe and I'm finally getting around to it. You've seen me design and build a lot of tools on this channel, but as I've discovered, Building someone else's design from their drawings is a totally different kind of challenge. Let's get started. Because this is a kit and it's sold by Hemingway in the UK, I am not going to be showing the drawings. They're not my copyright, it's not my design. I shoot everything in 4K and if I showed the drawings, you could freeze frame and extract the whole thing without purchasing their product. And I don't wanna do that, I wanna respect their copyright. I still do need something to show you so you can understand the context as I build this thing. So I went ahead and took the drawings and built this Fusion 360 model of the Knurler so I can explain how it works and how the different parts of it function. However, I won't be showing any of the dimensions or any of the original drawings just because I don't own them and that wouldn't be proper for me to do that. I did contact them and ask them about it and got no response. So I'm just going to respect their copyright and we're going to leave it at that. I will say two things about their drawings. One is they are absolutely beautiful. They're beautifully illustrated. They're beautifully laid out. They're on A3 paper. They're just, they're a thing of beauty. They're gorgeous. The second thing I will say about them is I hate them. And the reason is because everything is dimensioned in fractional inches. Now I get a lot of complaints when I use inches in any of my projects from all the metric people. Great. Yeah, I get it but there's a big difference between decimal inches and fractional inches. I mean, it's real great to say, oh, well, this is a 3 8 inch plate and we're going to split it and it's 3 16 and here's the 3 16 stock for that. But you start doing that and pretty soon you've got 3 16 and 5 16 and 7 16 and 9 16 and this might be okay if you have all of those dimensions, if you just know the decimals for those off the top of your head and if you're using the hand wheels on a mill, but man, if you're using a DRO, it is a real mess because now you're into the tenths place on the digits and it is pretty disorienting, at least it was for me. I almost just went and programmed this thing up to CNC these parts instead, but decided I really would like to do this as a manual machining project the way it was intended. I've never done one of these kits and I wanted to have that experience. I thought it would be fun. So that's what we're gonna do. However, since I am working with a DRO and since the dimensions on the drawings provided are not even from a common datum, they're just all over the place. I went ahead and generated my own set of drawings for manufacturing the parts that have the dimensions on them that I'll actually need. One way to do this would be to just get a pencil and sketch in all those dimensions on the drawings so that I have them while I'm working. Uh, but I decided since I was gonna make this model anyway, I went ahead and just generated some drawings. So, you know, for example, here's one simple part that I will show. I've established a datum in the center of the part and I have everything dimensioned from that datum. It just makes things a whole lot easier. I can find the ends of the stock because I'm actually going to defer the rounding of these pieces till later. I'm going to leave them long for now. And that gives me a coordinate system I can just drive to with my DRO. And it makes my job a lot easier and reduces the number of mistakes that I'll make building it. I'll still make mistakes, don't worry, you'll still get the entertainment value from that. If you haven't seen one of these tools before, this knurler is patterned after an older design made by Marlco, and it has a lot of the features of a typical clamp knurler. You've got two arms and some kind of a screw pressure assembly, but what makes this one unique is that there's a lever and a cam in this back joint, so that while you can turn the screw to raise and lower these arms and tighten them down in the workpiece, you have this lever and you have a cam that you can use to clamp onto the workpiece and release repeatedly. So you can get this adjusted the way you want it and then you can take the entire neural depth in one bite just by lowering the lever arm, take your neural across, release it, and then you can put in another part. Or if you prefer to feed on from the end, which is what they actually recommend in their directions, you can start with it clamped you can feed onto the end of the part, let the knurls establish and synchronize, knurl across, and then release it so that you can go off of the part without having to traverse off of the part. And then you can put another part in the same size and you can knurl that. So you, it gives you a way to clamp and unclamp it repeatedly. And the way this works, 
is there is a cam on an eccentric shaft here. If I hide a couple of these parts, you can kind of see what's happening. As this rotates, you can see that eccentric is moving on this top support. It raises the back of the top arm and that clamps the neurals together. Now this entire system is floating up and down, so you don't have to have it centered vertically. It will automatically center and you can adjust the feed pressure with the screw or how tightly it's clamped or the diameter of the workpiece and then you clamp and unclamp it with this lever. The feed pressure assembly on this knurler is kind of neat. You've got a brass nut with a screw and that screw goes into a brass part here that fits into a board opening in the upper arm. And you can see it's submerged far enough into the arm that this part can pull the arm up and support it as well as provide downward pressure. When you're providing downward pressure, there's a lot of surface area here. So the brass on steel bearing should make that very smooth. And this doesn't require any springs because the screw itself is captured with a couple of set screws in a groove in the end of the screw. And so the screw will actually pull up on the boss, which will pull up on the arm. So it's a clever little design. Uh, there are a lot of curves on a lot of these parts. And I think that's the primary challenge in machining this. And we're going to start with, of course, rectangular stock. And my plan is to machine all of these basically rectangular flat bar parts without putting any of the curves on them. I'll just leave them square. In the case of the ones with rounded ends, I'll leave them long. We'll go ahead and drill and ream all the holes in the correct locations. And then we'll come back later with the rotary table. We'll set that up and we'll round all of the ends and machine all of the curves at the same time. So we've got some flat bar work. We've got some lathe work. Let's uh, go out to the bench and get started. All of the materials required to build the knurler come in the kit. These are the side plates. The Brits call this BMS or bright mild steel. I think in the US we would just call this cold finished mild steel, probably 1018 or something similar. We've got the pieces for the arms. We've got the pieces for the side plates. And we've got some small blocks for the tool holder and the spacer. The 16th inch thick material for the wheel pin locks. It looks like it's been ground. I don't know exactly what that is. Then there are a number of pieces of what the Brits call silver steel. I think in the US we would just call this drill rod. I think these are mostly for pins and parts that don't need to be turned. For the parts that do need to be turned, they've supplied what they call FCMS or free cutting mild steel. I have no idea if this is a leaded alloy or if this is a lead free. I guess we'll see how it goes when we try to cut it. There are also some pieces of brass here for the nut, the trunnion, and various bushings for the assembly. And then they've included a small bag of hardware with all the screws. Uh, looking at these, I think these screws are too long. I don't know if I'm supposed to cut them or if I'll just substitute my own, but it looks like all of the hardware that's needed is included. Then I also picked up a couple of sets of neural wheels. I picked up a straight set and a diamond set. I was a little bit surprised at how small these are. They're really cute. Um, I'll have to see if I can get more for different patterns and different pitches. Now we just have to pick a place to start, and I think I'm going to start with the side guide plates for the pressure assembly. For now, I am not going to bother trimming these parts to length. I am instead going to wait until they're done, and I'll use the rounding operation on the ends to establish the final length of the part. So for now, all we need to do is drill and ream the holes and put the other features in this piece of steel. So I'm using the half function on my DRO to find the center, both side to side and front to back. And then I'll base all of the locations of the features off of that center datum. Of course, I'm just going to drive to zero, zero on the DRO, make sure that really looks like the center just as a sanity check. We'll hang the drawing up back here on the back of the mill with a magnet and get out some drills. There's a quarter inch pin in one end and a larger hole in the other end for the nut. So we'll just start by drilling this one size under quarter inch, and then we'll come back later with a reamer and ream this hole out for an exact fit on the pin. This stuff drills pretty easily, so it's just a matter of driving to the correct locations and putting in the holes. We've got two of these parts to do, so I'll just go ahead and swap them out with a stop just to reduce the amount of setup I have to do. These pieces of stock are about the same length. They're both a little bit longer than needed, so I can very easily just swap them with the stop and get the holes in the correct locations, and we should be good. Now, the holes on the other end of the part are larger, and in fact, we're getting very, very close to those parallels I have under the part. 
I did do the math and I checked to make sure that the parallels are against the vice jaws. And this is critically important. If you drill into the parallel, you're going to have a bad day. Now the reamers here are much, much longer than the drills. So I have to lower the knee on the mill. At some point I am going to get a power feed on the knee and that will make my life a lot easier. But for now I'll just crank. So these holes are drilled slightly undersized and I'll bring them out to the proper size with a reamer. And I've just got a Motley collection. This one actually is a spiral flute reamer and uh, the quarter inch reamer I happen to have is straight flute, but they do the same job and get the same results, at least in this situation. The last feature we need in the guide plates is a quarter inch slot. Now I'm cutting this with a quarter inch carbide end mill. This is a four flute end mill, but it is a center cutting type. So I'll just touch off with the quill, zero the DRO, lower the knee a little bit, and then we'll raise the knee to plunge the cutter to the desired depth. And I'm just gonna take this nice and slow. I wasn't really sure how this was gonna behave in this material, especially being a four flute end mill but it just went in nice and easy, didn't complain at all. So we'll get that to the depth, blowing away the chips just so I can see what's happening. It's not really necessary. You can hear the squeaking because now we've stopped cutting and I'll just start traversing. Now this is the point where I normally turn the hand crank the wrong direction and mess up the part, but not today. You can see it's cutting across. I'm just kind of feeling it by hand. I'm not using the power feed. I'm just kind of watching the chips and listening to how it cuts and it's cutting very, very smoothly. And you can see it's making a very nice chip and leaving a pretty clean slot. Just blowing away the chips to try to prevent them from getting caught on the end mill and recut. But really in this kind of an application, there's not too much danger of that. When I get to the end, I'll back off slightly, lower the knee to get out of the cut. And let's see where we ended up. You can see that the wall is a little bit rough there. The slot looks fine. The bottom of the slot looks great. The wall's a little bit rough. We'll go ahead and put the other part in and cut it using the same procedure. In the end, these measured slightly under a quarter of an inch. And so I went ahead and just put the part back in, ran to the same numbers on the DRO, made exactly the same cut, and it cleaned it up to maybe a thou over a quarter inch and smoothed up those walls considerably. Next up are the arms. We'll grab the stock provided from the kit, and this time we're gonna set up between the two vices. The reason for that will become apparent soon. And I'm gonna do exactly the same thing. Since I have two of these, I'm gonna go ahead and set up the stop and get this set up on parallels. Now I am holding the parallels over to the left because there is a hole in the upper right corner of these pieces that would hit them when I drill it. We'll get this tapped down on the parallels to make sure they're tight and don't move so they don't wander into the way of the drill as I'm working. And then we'll do exactly the same thing. We'll use an edge finder on all four sides to establish a datum in the center of the part. And again, these parts are too long and those will get trimmed to length when we round the corners on the ends. Once again, I'll just drive the DRO to zero zero and make sure that that visually looks like the center of the part. You have no idea how many parts I've screwed up and later have no idea how I did it. So I always check this because I'm afraid I'm gonna screw something up. This is especially true when I'm trying to keep track of cameras and how I'm presenting something for a YouTube video. The hole here in the end is just for the neural pin. It's quarter inch. We'll just go ahead and run the drill through. Now I'm pulsing the feed. You can kind of see that I'm pausing for just a moment to break the chip to make sure we don't end up with a great big razor sharp helicopter and then we'll come back with a quarter inch reamer and push it gently through the hole in one pass. For the lower arm, there's also a quarter inch hole for a pin near the center of the part. We'll go ahead and put that in, same drill. Literally, we'll just drill this out one size under a quarter inch and ream it to final size. And then the last hole here in the upper right corner is a 3 8 inch reamed hole for the hinge pin for the arm. This is the lower arm, so the shaft isn't rotating, so there's no bush. It's just straight up 3 8 inch hole. Now the upper arm is similar but different. It's just similar enough to be confusing, so I keep checking the drawings to make sure I'm putting everything in the right place. 
We'll start with the 7 16th inch hole in the upper right corner. And this one's 7 16th because there is a bushing in this hole for the cam to rotate. We'll just do the same thing. We'll go ahead and push the drill through and then come back and ream it. This is a larger hole, so you really have to lean on the drill to get it to make progress with no pilot, but it just went right through like butter. Now we'll come back with a 7 16th inch reamer, and this is where the problems begin. Yeah, that's not cutting at all. Yeah, I screwed up. I was supposed to use a drill one size under 7 16ths of an inch, and I used a 7 16ths inch drill. So this is me staring at the part, trying to think about what I'm going to do. Yeah, there's the Imperial Fist Shake, and I think... I think since this is a bushed hole, I can just go ahead and turn the bush slightly oversized, force it in, and we'll be fine. I'll know it's there, but nobody else will if you don't tell anyone. Since I'm not going to remake the part, we'll go ahead and finish it. I'll put the quarter inch hole in here for the neural pin and ream that to size. Unfortunately, I got the correct drill because it was still sitting in the tray. Okay. That's that. Now let's get set up to bore the hole in the top edge here. The last feature we need to mill in this arm is a 5 8 inch hole for the trunnion. And we're going to start making that hole by just plunging out material with two flute end mills. Because this hole overlaps the edge of the part, I've got to knock the parallel out. It's in there nice and tight because I hammered the part down, so I'll just use an aluminum rod here and tap it out. I wanted it in there when we cut the 7 16 inch hole in the end because there was a lot of pressure on it, but now it's just in the way. We'll start with a 3 8 inch two flute end mill and just plunge down. I've got the quill locked and we'll go in with the knee. I have the quill extended quite a way, so I was a little bit worried about the rigidity of this, but it's just cutting nice and smooth. I'm not hearing any chatter or anything. It's just going in nice and easy, even though the end mill is overlapping the edge of the part. I started small and figured I'd work my way up, but I probably could have just plunged this two diameter in one pass. Oh well, we've got a 3 8 inch hole. We'll get a bigger end mill and enlarge it. Next end mill here is a half inch end mill and we'll do exactly the same thing, but I'll run it a little bit slower. Maybe not that slow. Just add a little bit of oil and plunge this thing in using the knee. Now we've got a really interrupted cut because we're overlapping the edge of the part even more, but mill doesn't even seem to care. We're just pushing this through nice and easy. This will bring the hole to a half inch. I do have a 5 8 inch end mill, so we could just plunge it directly to 5 8 but I want to control the diameter precisely. I don't want to risk overcutting it, so we'll use a Criterion style boring head here in the mill with a high speed steel boring bar. Now my intuition says this might be a little bit risky because that boring bar might actually catch on the sharp corner and it might bend it and snap it off, but there's really only one way to find out. This is a pretty rigid setup. I'll just take a little whisper cut on the first pass and we'll just see how it behaves. I am using the power down feed on the mill so we get a nice, even, consistent cut. And that's going nice and smooth. It's just taking a couple thou off, but it is cutting and it doesn't seem to be complaining. I'm not seeing any artifacts near that sharp edge, so I think this is going to work. I don't want to raise the head while it's still spinning because I don't want to cut a spiral groove in the surface there, so I'll just rotate it out of the way and raise it straight up. I'll just start measuring here with calipers. There's no reason to get too excited about precision yet because we're not even close. We're at what? 510 and we're going to 625. We've got a ways to go. So I will just dial in a 10 thousandths cut. That'll add 20 thousandths to the size of the hole. This will be our first real cut. We'll just take it and see how it runs. We'll get it down close and then I will kick in the power down feed and let it go. And that sounds great. I don't see any reason to be concerned with this at all. Let's just go ahead and keep taking these cuts. No need to push it. I'm not in a big hurry, so we'll just dial 10 thou at a time, 20 thou off the diameter, and just let it run. Now that we're getting close to the final diameter, it's time to start taking some precision measurements. I'll switch to the telescoping bore gauges. I'd like to use my three-point internal mics, but there's not enough hole. Okay, I have dialed in half of the remaining material. 
we'll take one cut, measure, and then take the final cut, just like we would on the lathe. And everything is proceeding as expected. And this should be the last cut. Now, I don't know if you can hear it, but I could hear it in person. That last cut sounds heavy. I really don't know what I did. It may just be because the markings on the boring head are so small and so close together. But that sounded a little bit heavy to me. Let's take our final measurement and see where we are. Should be at 625 and yeah, 626 and a half. So I ended up a thou and a half over on this. Let's try it with the actual piece of brass that needs to fit in there. This brass is nominally 625. It actually measures about 624. So we've got about two and a half thou of clearance. That's a little more than I would prefer. It's gonna be just fine. I really wanted this to be a thou, maybe three quarters, half a thou, something like that, just to have that really buttery smooth precision fit, but it's not really needed. And really, nobody is gonna know about this as long as I don't tell anyone and you don't tell anyone. Let's take another look at that 7 16 inch hole that I drilled to the nominal size. Drills always go a little bit oversized. How bad is it? Here's a 437, it should be 437 and a half. So the 437 should fit, and actually it fits a lot tighter than I expected. That drill's drilling closer to size than I thought it would. Let's try a 438. This should be a half thou bigger than the hole's supposed to be. Doesn't go through, so we may be pretty close to the correct size. Let's try it from the other side and see what happens. And yeah, it goes at least halfway through the part. So the hole isn't exactly straight, the 437 does fit nicely. Let's try 439. And yeah, 439 doesn't fit at all. So the actual hole size isn't perfectly cylindrical and it's somewhere a little bit over 438. Let's try the uh, three point internal mic and see what it shows. Now it looks like we're at about 438. Yeah, I call it 438 and a half. And I think depending on exactly where you measure, it's gonna be a little bit different just because the inside of this bore is a little bit rough. We'll try it in another spot here and see if it shows anything different. Yeah, 438.4. So we're about 438 and a half. I think the plan to just go ahead and make the bushing slightly oversized and press it in is gonna work just fine. Just don't tell anybody. That's all I have time for today, but I feel like we're off to a good start. I've got several of the parts well on their way, and so far, all of the dumb mistakes I've made are fixable. Have any of you built this kit? Do you have any great advice for me? Put it down in the comments. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up, feel free to subscribe to the channel, and maybe consider supporting me over on Patreon. Thank you for watching.